Welcome to Idle Red Hands Weekly. I'm Jeremy. I'm Lyle. And what is Idle Red Hands Weekly? It is an incision made in the gum to expose tooth and bone. Bone is removed, and the tooth is then divided into sections if it's easier to remove in the process. The tooth is removed, and the site is cleaned of any debris from tooth or bone. The wound is stitched closed to promote healing. Gauze is placed over the extraction site to control bleeding and to help blood clot. I don't think I'm prepared. I just came with some gaming stuff. <laughs> Didn't know we're doing uh, dental surgery. Right. So that's that's the reason why uh, uh, Chris isn't here this week. So I just got back. From, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah Okinawa. Okinawa Comic yes. Con. Yeah. So it was under threat, as I mentioned last week, is under threat of the uh, the typhoon. And they were talking about canceling it. Yeah. And it looks like the typhoon just went way around and then just destroyed Tokyo, the Kanto area. They were saying uh, it was Comic-Con and sauna this year because the weather was still pretty hot. It was still summer right. summer temperatures. And there was no AC in the hall where they held the comic Con. It's a strange thing. They had these like two meter in diameter industrial fans to cool everything. Right. But because it's a show of all paper, they can't turn them up you know, to any sort of strength. So they just have them on this low setting and all it does is kind of push the stink around. <laughs> And so it doesn't really circulate right. or relieve anybody. Yes, yeah, so it was a little, little sweaty, but uh, an interesting mix. So it was held at uh, Camp Foster, so on base. This base is more open to the public, so they allow Japanese citizens mm-hmm. on base for flea markets and live concerts and right. things. So they have a lot of kind of public relations stuff. This is the third time that they had this Comic-Con, and it's very much a traditional American-style Comic-Con. It's all yeah. you know, Disney, Marvel, Star Wars. Um, I guess that's all the same thing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all of the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a Disney. All right. <laughs> and, uh, but they had the same big sponsors like Diamond and a lot of the big companies are sponsors yeah. of the Comic-Con. And also Tokyo Comic-Con. So I guess that's the, the business entity of all of this. And they're starting mm-hmm. to do smaller shows like this around Japan because they're so different from like comic market, like the comic cat manga market style shows that they do in Japan. So it's less obsessive fans and just, you know, rose and rows and rows of tables. It's more an event, a pop culture event, and right. you can get bigger, probably bigger sponsorships and bigger Western companies, at least. To Any involved. big names there? Or? So no, nobody huge. And uh, I was right next to Momoko Peach, who is a Japanese artist that does a lot of alt covers for Marvel Comics. So, okay, yeah. yeah. And I think she also did some cover work for that line of manga that Marvel was trying to release in Chinese language, original Chinese language okay. in, for China. Yeah. So they're looking for Asian talent to kind yeah. of use to get into the market. Yeah. But I got to hear the uh, Marine Corps band play Star Wars and the Avengers theme and Back to the Future again Gosh. and again and again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this were the three songs they learned. <laughs> hey, what about the uh, back issues? And that's something that mm. if you're a comic book fan in Japan mm-hmm. and you won't actually want uh, what they call floppies, what I called back in the day comic books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's hard to get back issues. Yes. But w- was there a lot of like long boxes and no, dealers? No, very, very minimal. I think there were yeah. only one or two. Most people were selling toys, like, you know, like okay. statues and collectibles yeah. and things. But the and, kind of toys that you would get back home or the yes. kind of toys you get? Yeah, okay. Kind of the, yeah. the stuff you get through Diamond, the kind yeah. of like the little resin statues and things of yeah. the heroes. What about action figures? And action figures too. Oh gosh, I should have given you a list. <laughs> And it was an interesting mix of, so mostly military, mostly DOD employees yep. and, and enlisted, and then uh, some Japanese uh, public. And the interesting thing was they didn't tell us ahead of time, but we needed both American dollars and yen to make change if we were going to sell anything. Be able oh, to, they're still doing stuff like that on the bases. Yeah, wow. you can use, cat, you can use uh, American dollars. And so I wasn't prepared and people were like throwing American money at me and I... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a yeah. that was a surprise. And this was the first Comic Con I ever attended where people actually had like loaded guns on the uh, the floor. So I'll usually, give you like an American experience, <laughs> yes, <right. laughs> the open carry experience <laughs> yeah. of uh, right because the um, you know there's a lot of cosplay, so a lot of people have plastic guns and swords, but there's also the MPs and the military that had sidearms, and mm-hmm. so people are walking around with actual firearms while other people are playing pretend. And there was a girl in cosplay that was just like pointing a pistol to show people where to go to the restrooms or whatever. And all of the military like were dodging her point. <laughs> she was just pointing a, a plastic gun around. Obviously, their training had, uh, you know. Uh, was it a realistic looking gun? Or? It, it was, yeah, because it's Japanese, it's all black, you know, so it doesn't, yeah. it's not orange or yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's, it was a yeah, Japanese. It, people don't know, like, like yeah. you get really realistic looking air guns. Yes, yes. And so it was funny to see how uncomfortable and how well trained <laughs> the military was when some civilian was just waving a gun around. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was fun. And yeah. um, that's good. And this is going to. 
a, be a trend, I think, a lot mm-hmm. of uh, smaller Comic Cons and, and lo- locations around Japan to kind of bring that American pop culture. Because, like I said, they've got the sponsors, so they're going to try to do little shows. And so that'll be fun to see. It'll give me an opportunity to travel more around the country, like yeah. domestic oh, that's good. Yeah. travel. One thing that I saw, a press release that actually just came out from Modifius, they are going to be producing a tabletop RPG for the Homeworld setting. And I know Modifius. I don't know Homeworld. Yeah, Homeworld is a... Mm-hmm. I'm not sure originally if it was Relic or Gearbox. Like it was a, it's a PC game from the from 1999, so it's 20 years old okay. this year. Okay, yeah, I wasn't playing PC games back then. Right, and it's a, a very kind of classic RTS, but it was a, a new style where your homeworld is destroyed, but before it was destroyed, you found evidence that the planet that you lived on was actually not your planet of origin. And okay. So there's a guide stone that was found, and so they built a mothership, invented faster than light travel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we're attacked immediately by aliens. The planet was destroyed, and then you know, kind of Battlestar Galactica style, searching. Oh yeah, 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 searching for their home. So it's RTS in the way that you're constantly building ships to support harvesting resources, and you're sending. How are you harvesting resources in in space? From yeah, from like asteroids or whatever. Like yeah, Yeah. so you have to send certain groups out to to different uh, systems and have them gather things, and also they'll get into combat. So you have to you know balance your resources Hmm. in combat. So very standard kind of '90s. Uh, RTS. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah so, but uh, very, very famous and very much loved. And there were two sequels to that. There was Homeworld 2, and then there was a uh, prequel, which took place on the on the original desert planet that was destroyed. And there is a third game, or I guess a fourth game, but the Homeland 3 is in production now. So I think that's why Modifius jumped on this, because the popularity will be probably back again. Okay, yeah. They, they did a remastered version of the first two games to kind of upgrade the textures and make them look more HD. Yeah. This game will be called Homeworld Revelations. So I'm sure it'll have a lot to do with kind of the the history and what was discovered about the kind of mystery of where this homeworld is and, right. and where they're where they're actually going. Well, you had me at Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> okay. So I, I like Battlestar Galactica, and I guess that's a way around the. I've seen recently people want something other than the colonial or colonization style science fiction mm-hmm. settings or stories. Right. So I guess if they're finding not a new world but their old world Mm -hmm. but i you know battlestar galactica was doing that in the late 70s so right but no i like that yeah yeah and it's it was also like a wagon train i guess Mm -hmm. like like a star it's like well it's well it's really battlestar galactica which was star wars and star trek together right right. i want to see what they're going to do with it because uh the game is fun and interesting but as far as like playing multiple characters and playing a campaign of it i, I want to know what they're going to do and you know where, where it's going to be set and yeah and, I, I would guess they'd be you know just like just like battlestar galactica because I, I don't know homeworld but i do know battlestar galactica mm-hmm. you have your fleet so you can play you know jumping from different ships and mm-hmm. maybe you were in charge of a ship and that one thing battlestar galactica had was like a primary antagonist in the mm-hmm. cylons does homeworld have something I like think that so i think the alien race that Oh, yeah, destroyed, okay. Yeah, yeah, destroyed the world is kind of the nemesis. Okay. And so I'm not sure if you're actually fleeing them in that storyline or if you're just going to be encountering them and like that, they'll, they'll be the big bads. Right, yeah. right. Another thing that I saw online is a Kickstarter just started for a game that we enjoyed. This is a new expansion for Village Attacks. So they're doing Grim Dynasty. And that's uh, Grim Lord Games, and it's a Chinese mythology, Chinese folklore-based expansion, kind of a, a big expansion for Village Attacks. So whereas Village Attacks used, you know, vampires and revenants and more European-influenced monsters, this mm-hmm. is going to be all Chinese-based, and right. also have Chinese villagers that are attacking in, okay, in village yeah. heroes. I guess for people who don't know uh, Village Attacks in the prior expansions, mm-hmm. they would take different mythologies, and then they, like for example, they had First Nations mythology, right. like in North America, but they would have two monsters mm-hmm. in the pack. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. And then, like a village hero. Yeah. yeah like yeah. so, you get get what three or four? Yeah. So this will be like four or five of those all together. Yeah. And more kind of theme thematically tied together. I see. Yeah. yeah. So the game, if anybody doesn't know Village Attacks, the game is a one to five player fully co op kind of castle defense game. So they reverse the roles where you play the bad guys held up in your castle, and the villagers with torches and pitchforks are laying siege to your castle, and you have different uh, objectives. So you're either trying to protect the heart of the castle, so the magic is protected, or you're just trying to stay alive. Live. Well, when you play it, you're not the bad guys <laughs> That's because right. they're coming into your castle. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it, the models look good. I want to take a look at uh, if they're going to change any rules or there's mm-hmm. going to be new mechanics based right. on that. Right. But, yeah, it's an enjoyable game, so mm-hmm. it's, it's something worth taking a look at. And you can get through this Kickstarter, of course, the original core game and any of the other expansions that you missed the first time around. Right. 
Are you following Games Workshop news? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. The, the Psychic Awakening, I think, is their yes. the next big, big event. Yeah, yeah, big event. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, I saw read an interesting article of uh, Spiky Bits, and I guess they do this with every release. And uh, the release is the Blood of the Phoenix, which is mm-hmm. the Eldari uh, focused around the ho- Howling Banshees and the mm-hmm. Jukari, the Dark Eldar. Right. Focused around. I'm not uh, familiar with the Jukari, but uh, <laughs> guys that fight in hand to hand, which I think is almost all of them, but. <laughs> They do an interesting breakdown of the savings you get. So when you buy this box, you get these mm-hmm. two factions and you get some uh, rules or yeah. scenarios and the savings that you get. Because people are very surprised it's going to retail for $230 American, mm-hmm. and which is more expensive than the previous ones, such as Wake the Dead, which was, uh, again, uh, focused around uh, the Aldari's Wrathguard. Right. Kind of the unliving robot uh, versus the Space Marines and there's other ones. And the savings has gone down. Mm. And they're just showing that as, I, I guess you're going to save with the miniatures $132. Mm-hmm. And like maybe Wake the Day was over 150 and stuff. Oh, I see. Yeah. But, Are they doing all plastic banshees? Is this the first time yeah. we're getting yeah, plastic banshees uh, in that set? I don't think, gosh, that's a good question. I uh, I never, I never actually, I, I've had Eldar mm-hmm. for years but i never got the howling banshees because it was like striking scorpions or howling banshees and uh, so i i went with the striking scorpions mm-hmm. so yeah i don't know that this is because maybe the dire avengers have plastic miniatures mm-hmm. yeah they're probably going to be rolling out other aspect the warriors mm-hmm. like they've, they've got some old models in the range like the warp spider models are pretty old i believe the dark reapers are oldish but i mean they did revamp them a little bit but i believe they revamped them as primary primarily metal Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seems like they're giving a little bit of attention to just about every army because we're seeing, you know, we saw some new plastic orcs last year that, you know, updated some old yeah. uh, old resin or old uh, fine cast. Well, all the Phoenix Lords need updating. So, yeah. The, uh, yeah, so in Blood of the Phoenix, there's going to be the, the Howling Banshee Phoenix Lord. Uh-huh. So that'd be good. So definitely eye on that box set, but I'm not 100% sure I'm going to get it. Mm-hmm. But I'll definitely be getting the... The first book, yeah. First, yeah, the Phoenix Rising. Yes, the first yeah. book because nice. they're going to be allowing you to like do different things with craft worlds and like kind of create your own craft world mm-hmm. and uh, different abilities, pick and choose. And I guess they're going to be rolling out psychic stuff for all the factions. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, yeah, I think all the factions could use new psyker models. I know like weird boys for orcs are ancient. There, I don't even know if you can get an actual weird boy character anymore. Yeah, people are using the Age of Sigmar <laughs> version and kind of kit bashing it over. That may mean that they're gonna everyone's gonna get you know some psychic attention some at least some updated models for uh for psychic warfare so that'll be yeah it'll be good i guess my big gaming news is i've got mercenary spies and private eyes mm-hmm. which i pledged through kickstarter yeah and i got like everything that they had because it was looking really good and uh, people are not familiar with the game it's flying buffalo and they're probably more famous for tunnels and trolls right has been around forever and this is wow well, I, I think the title says it all what, what kind of characters that you play not mercenary spies and private eyes necessarily with superpowers pretty like you're playing your spy story in different eras or private eye story written by michael stackpole mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you might know him for he wrote i think it was called the pullman report and it was a counter argument to the people that were blaming dungeons and dragons oh yeah and i think it I think Pullman was maybe one of the, might have been the mother, you know, mm-hmm. the mothers against D&D or something, right. or mad at D&D or something like that. And he wrote the counter argument why D&D wasn't corrupting people. And he wrote this game and he brought it back and he contributed to it. So it's always nice. nice. Yeah. And they release a new edition and then they're adding new stuff. And then, But the original designer, original writer, That's great, comes yeah. in to write the new stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm really impressed. And one thing Flying Buffalo does that not a lot of role-playing game do is they're kind of famous for their solo adventures. Mm-hmm. Of the three adventures I got, two of them are solo adventures, nice. which I think is great because, I mean, we have such a hard time getting games to the table. Mm-hmm. So I can actually play the games and learn how to play the games oh, yeah. by doing these solo adventures and getting getting kind of a feel. So surprising more games don't do that. Yeah, that's it's, it's nice when they have an introductory adventure, but maybe an introductory adventure that's solo. It's mm-hmm. a good point. Yeah, I think Tunnels and Trolls was credited with having the very first solo adventure. The only other thing you could do with like fantasy roleplay would be like fighting fantasy book. You know, yeah, that, that was the closest. Choose thing your own adventure. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, and that's what a solo adventure is—is is a deluxe version of a choose your own adventure. Mm-hmm. So, what was all included in the the pledge level? Like, what what did you get? The hardcover core book, mm-hmm. and then I added on the three different adventures. Two of them solo and then i added on the dungeon master screen oh, nice. so yeah mm-hmm. 
And then I think they threw in a poster. People might be familiar that uh, Rick Lomas or Loomis. Oh, uh, yes. He unfortunately died of cancer while they were doing the... Uh, the Kickstarter was finished. It was closed, but then they hadn't fulfilled everything. He was struggling with cancer and then right. he, he passed away, unfortunately. Also, they had a little bit of trouble with shipping. Of course, this pales in comparison to losing Rick Loomis. The shipping was like 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. So you're like, wow, what a bargain. Right. You know, that's amazing. And it turns out they, when, after Loomis passed away, they weren't sure how he got that deal. Uh, I see. So they were like on the hook, in my case, over 50 bucks for the shipping. Oh, wow. They honored everybody. They said, we do it. But they said, oh, we really appreciate it if people could pay more shipping mm -hmm. to cover the cost so they didn't take as much of a bath wow. on it. So I, I ended up in the end paying, they said, another 15 bucks. And yeah, sure. And then when I saw the, the actual shipping, when it came, came in it was over 50 bucks so i said oh, i threw in the rest good, good you know yeah it's difficult companies can really take a bath on yeah. that not being able to estimate the shipping costs yeah and the kickstarter was run beautifully good i mean despite having like two big setbacks one very tragic so yeah i was very impressed with how they did it and i'm seeing a lot about indie games mm -hmm. i think it's because and it's the only time i'm going to mention wendy's but yeah because <laughs> of the, the wendy's thing right and that's great like people trying to drum up support for different indie games that they like and mm -hmm. that's fabulous but people need to understand like a game a company like flying buffalo which has been around forever yeah even like Steve Jackson games or Palladium games, these are very small operations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they take a, like a $35 hit from shipping, I mean, that really hurts Yeah, these companies. And just like definitely show all, you, all the love you can to the indie games. But don't think that a, a company like Flying Buffalo is like, like Hasbro. <laughs> right, exactly. They don't, they don't have Hasbro money or anything like yes. that. So I'm not hating on any big companies either. But how many big companies would there be? Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, I think that's the only publicly owned. I mean, you know, because yeah. Hasbro and I think anybody else is public. Yeah. So and what would be number two? Like maybe Paizo. Paizo would yeah, definitely be. Still, like, you know, like these are all small operations mm -hmm. where they, they fit the entire company a little shot. Yeah, right. You know, in front of some small buildings. So, yes. <laughs> so they're definitely not these uh, capitalist barons. <laughs> so, so you can you can buy from these companies guilt free. I think now you can buy from any company guilt free. It's <laughs> really, my opinion. But you know, if you want to keep your socialist cred, you, I think Flying Buffalo would fall under that. Yeah, that works. Kind of tie it into what I've been seeing on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Is Twitter can be really binary. It's like this or this. Mm. I mean, it's, I guess you lose a lot of nuance in those little tweets. But it, people are like, hey, don't do a backstory. If you do a backstory, just write a novel or something like that. <laughs> I mean, people, if you want to do a backstory for your characters, like, that's great. Whatever whatever you like to do. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm more of a front story kind of person where I don't write an extensive backstory. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of see what kind of, how the game is going. And then, mm. hey, how would I add this to my backstory? And then maybe you could use it right. in the game. But just the timing, I got the Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes, and this conversation was going on on Twitter. This makes a really good case for, or, or not makes a case for backstory, but when you're reading it, it's not trying to sell you on backstory, but it's showing you how you can incorporate backstory mm -hmm. into character creation, and as well as helping the game master create the story and just like when you're buying the skills it's like okay you get this skill why did you get this skill like where'd you grow up and it's like okay but you want to buy this skill but you know <laughs> is that really realistic that a kid growing up in like brooklyn mm -hmm. is like uh, really good at horseback riding or something like that <laughs> right right so that was nice when you're looking at the character creation is as you're building your character mathematically or whatever you're also organically creating a backstory mm. and you're like hey this is my motivation well you know how did i become a private eye you know what's my relationship to the other characters it, these games seem to run with like a small group of people it mm -hmm. seems like yeah like you're not gonna have a mass of spies right <laughs> okay 10 of you are going to be uh, infiltrating this island so that was neat but then also michael stackpole was like writing about the different types of nemesis you can create so for your players but then talking about how you can draw from the backstory and that mm. so it becomes like a back and forth like what kind of nemesis do you want and unintentionally reading this thing may kind of open my eyes to the potential of backstory which mm -hmm. maybe i hadn't fully considered mm. Do you think some systems, because we've seen, especially with modifius games like 2D20s, they're really heavily reliant on the life path. Do you think yeah. some game systems have done that to just avoid backstory, to like avoid making the decision? They're basically like either letting you generate it randomly or choose. Do you think that's a, a deliberate choice? Probably. And yeah. certainly Traveler does that as well mm -hmm. and, and still does that right. in, in the new 
the the mongoose publishing version. I don't think they're trying to avoid the backstory. I think they're I think they're doing something similar to Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes. Is they're trying to create it. You know, if you're going to spend your points on different skills, hey, well, how did this come about? Right. And Star Trek Adventures does that. Yes, right. Where each step is also a step in your backstory, so mm-hmm. to speak. So I think they're actually trying to encourage you to do it. Right. Instead of saying, hey, write a write a novel. And hey, if you <laughs> want to write a novel about your character, that's mm-hmm. great. I think the advantage of a game like Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes is that you, you're playing with a small group of players. Mm-hmm. Seems to lend itself more to a small group of players, like one or two private eyes, one or two spies, even solo, not you're playing by yourself, but one spy and one game master it it seems very doable in that case your backstory is going to get a lot of attention Mm -hmm. but if you play with like seven or eight players your backstory probably won't get as much attention right uh, because it's going to be very hard for the game master to incorporate it or if you're playing like a published adventure Mm. like if you're playing the you know curse of stroud maybe the game master can incorporate some stuff but yeah but it's harder because (laughs) they've got to get through this thing I guess the primary takeaway is whatever you want to do, there's definitely a case of why a backstory is really good. And it's nice to read something from way back when Mm -hmm. by a guy that wrote this game way back when. And then you're still like, hey, that's it shouldn't be a fresh take on backstory. You know, maybe it isn't for a lot of people out there. But yeah, yeah, it's nice to read a role playing game and get get a fresh take on an old idea. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't really gaming related so much, but I, I've been watching this YouTube channel a lot called Good Bad Flicks. Mm-hmm. The, the guy t- takes nor- normally lower budget movies, you know, right. exploitation films, B movies, but it, he also does bigger budget movies as well and talks about them. But the the core idea of this video is it, like he'll kind of walk you through the, the movie. So mm-hmm. sometimes I, I turn them off because they're like, ooh, I want to see this spiders. It sounds like there's some some reveals here. He takes the piss out of, out of the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then he always ends with like a real appreciation for the movies mm, right? and tells you like how it got made and, and why he likes it. So even though these are what, what you consider a bad movie, you can understand why he li- actually likes these movies, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they're looking at horror films, post-apocalyptic films, straight up exploitation films. I really like that because of how it's very positive. Like you can laugh at the movie, but you then walk away. I actually want to see that movie. Mm-hmm. You have respect for the filmmakers and the actors that were involved in making that movie and what they had to go through. Right. And like a lot of people criticize it. And you you listen to a spirited defense on this is how they made it. And is it made on this budget? And this is why it was good. And this is why the critics are wrong. (laughs) But I I really like that because it's like a positive channel. Yeah. And I think a lot of YouTube is basically shitting on other other people oh, yeah. or other things and it's all like yeah cinema sins and things where they're like this is all the mistakes that they made in this movie or yeah very negative yeah so, so i definitely recommend it and and just to link it to games i think there's a, like you've watched like these post apocalyptic stuff or these horror movies and you're like a lot of great ideas to incorporate mm-hmm. into your game oh yeah you might ha- have like a very simple plot but Simple plots are the ones that are easier to make in your game. It's like Inception. Yeah. It's like, yeah right. All right. Like, let's play. Ah, uh, what? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> How are you going to do that? Mm. So Definitely good sources for, for inspiration for, yeah. for, for role play. Yeah. And just like for a good night, just to watch. And horror. I mean, it's all these different horror movies out there. And it's such a, yeah, the, as a game, man, that's really hard to do. Yeah. Horror games. No, that's That might true. be something for us to discuss a little in yeah. future episodes is... Yeah, I think both with our experience of the, just like Grimmer Space, that what we've played with for the Starfinder system, that setting being a horror setting, and then also the Alien RPG. Yeah, we've been talking a bit about how horror works and, and what you have to do about the expectations and how to kind of maintain that atmosphere. So I think that would definitely be worth visiting. Yeah, we'll be rolling out our Alien review soon. Yes, right. And right. I am the one that's holding it back, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so both both the video and uh, podcast audio version are coming out. So, yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's the audio that's holding us back, unfortunately. <laughs> that's, that's me. But it, it'll sound super clean. Nice. I hope. <laughs> But even things like Tales from the Loop and then uh, Things from the Flood have kind of horror elements, you know, m- much lighter, more X-Files. Well, it depends on well, yeah. the convention, but yeah. <laughs> it depends on who's running it, yeah. No, absolutely. And I think, uh, well, Grimmer Space has promised it's going to, or they're talking about, they had like ideas of the different types of horror. Mm-hmm. And they'll release oh, that. Right. You can listen to our interview with uh, one of the designers mm-hmm. and he talks about the some of the some of the types of horror. Yes. But then you also 
I mean, that, that would be a fantastic resource. But then you can also go to like good, bad flicks, mm -hmm. going through exploitation films or slashers or comedy horror and that and just like the elements that they have mm -hmm. and the tropes and that. And right. that's always like helpful. And you're like, okay, if I want to have that vibe or I don't want to have that vibe, mm -hmm. you know, because that's going to be a problem with my group. So I should avoid these. And, right. you know, how do you do it? I'm mm -hmm. oh, sorry. It, I, yeah. <laughs> it as in the oh, horror I mean, movie, it. Uh, <laughs> You, you know how you know it. how do you do it? You know you got like kids and horror, and it's like mm -hmm. the walk in the line, and you see that, and the changes between the book and the and the movie. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. oh, let's not have the the child orgy. Uh, so, <laughs> that was good in the books. You know, like, right. learn, learn from the filmmakers. Yeah. And the interesting thing in more recent horror movies is kind of their self-awareness or their kind of subverting genres and things. So like a, a movie like Cabin in the Woods that yep. st started out as a slasher film that's, and then that's a great turned movie. into cosmic yeah. horror. Yeah, that, yeah. Is, yeah. that is. That is so, so clever. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a big Joss Whedon fan, but with that, I'm like, dip that, <laughs> dip that. And I guess something we're working on for I Lord of Hands, uh, the Alien Review, which is going to come out shortly. So that's in the can already. But we, we do have an unearthing for Torg. So please watch it. Mm. We definitely saw things that we can improve upon. Mm. And we we have a lot of like the physical copies of some really old ones. And we've decided our next one is going to be Avalon Hills for entry into role-playing <laughs> games. Powers and perils. Right. Oh. Historically, that'll be a very interesting thing to look at because with the timing, they were just trying to kind of catch up with what had gotten away from them in the gaming world with Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. yeah. So if you are excited by that news, great, because we'll be delivering that. But if there's things that you want to want us to talk about in that particular unearthing, mm. just comment. Probably the best place would be contact us on Twitter right. or comment on the Torg unearthing because mm -hmm. you can kind of see, oh, this is what they did with the Torg one. Eh, <laughs> could have been, these things could have been better. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, just post there in the comments and mm -hmm. we would definitely want any feedback that people have. So stay tuned. So we'll be talking about the history of that as well as we have physically the, the two box sets that Avalon Hill came out with mm -hmm. and the story behind their purchase. Mm. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we'll be going through the physical components. So it's like an unboxing and a history lesson. Right. right. Yeah. Our goal is for these unearthed things, we actually have the physical the physical game. So you actually see us have it and go through yeah. it. And see the, the discoloration and the mustiness of it and yeah, get the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, smell of vision <laughs> yeah. It's like a time capsule. So if people want to get in touch with you, Lyle, you are running the Outer Red Hands Twitter. Yes. So probably the, the Twitter is the best... Way. Uh, just on Twitter, we, mm -hmm. we had a, uh, for us, uh, a reasonably successful tweet with a mm -hmm. uh, Dungeons Dragons movie tidbit. Oh. And that's actually, I got that information from Good Bad Flex. Nice. So just, just to give credit where credit is due. Nice. Yeah. The Twitter, so Outer Red Hands on Twitter, and uh, the website as well, if you want to get in touch with the, the podcast and things that we've uh, posted for download. And then we're pretty it? good about responding on our YouTube videos oh, as yeah. well. So right, if you yeah. comment there, we yeah, YouTube comments, try to jump yeah. on that. I do a weekly live stream for my single panel mm -hmm. gag cartoon. So abusecartoons.com if you want to check that out. And, it's and also you've been doing a lot for Ink October. Oh, yes. Inktober. Inktober, right. Inktober. Yeah, so on my... Your Spaceman. Yes, my uh, uh, Citizen Spaceman. So the that was the third book that I released at uh, Okinawa Comic Con. Yeah. So the third part of that story. And so, yeah, I've been just doing my inspirational sketches and things that I'd done for producing that book, putting those up as my uh, Inktober yeah. entries. I think yeah. I'm going to think, I'm going to say October 13th was a sad one. Yeah. <laughs> was, it, was it the father or something? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that was a really sad one. So, yeah. Was it October 13th? Yes, it was. I think. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, people, yeah. Take a look at that one. I think that was pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> yeah, profound. Yeah, yeah, it's getting... It took me a moment. I'm like, oh. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, so Instagram is just my name, Jeremy Lambros, and you can get that through the uh, the website, so abusecartoons.com, and then mm -hmm. both on YouTube and Twitch is the live stream. So that's every Monday uh, in Japan, so Sunday night, uh, North American time. And if you'd like to get in touch with Idle Red Hands, as we mentioned, the Twitter at Idle Red Hands, IdleRedHands.com is the podcast, all our videos and uh, downloadables for different games. And if you really want to be involved in the podcast, please visit Patreon.com slash Idle Red Hands. That'll give you the ability to give us suggestions, very detailed feedback, and let you uh, kind of tailor the podcast to more of what you want to hear. We'll be back next week. Bye. Bye.
Don't